Today on Real Ghost Stories Online, an old friend's life comes to an end. However, her spirits never die. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown. Possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. That it is. 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us, of course. You can also write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. If you want access to all of the bonus material, which is, um, no joke, the world's largest audio archive of ghost stories, uh, you get our EPP bonus episodes. We put out new ones every week, by the way, of those. The full archive, which is almost 400 episodes there. And then the full archive of all the other episodes, all the regular ones, which numbers into the thousands. Um, and you could listen probably 24-7, and you're going to go into 2022 at this point. Uh, if you're, you know, listening to this in uh, October uh, of... Uh, of 2021. Uh, so anyway, check it out. Ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. Get in and all that stuff. And of course that supports the show and keeps it on the air. So happy almost Halloween, everyone on October 26, 2021. This is 2020. Oh <laughs> shit. Yeah. yeah. It's a uh, Tony and Carol with you. Hey, what's going on? So I got a story for you. Okay. Um, this happened to my sister. Mm-hmm. It's not paranormal, but it's like a what the f kind of story. Is this Kathy's sister who's been on the yeah, show? Yeah, my okay. sister Kathy. Okay. She's been on the program before, yep. and so she lives in a small town I won't name, but I will narrow it down to Southeast Kansas. And um, she went to the Walmart the mm-hmm. other day, mm-hmm. and she was buying some stuff, and there was a woman pushing a cart. Her Kathy said, looked like about an 18 month old child in Mm. the little seat Mm -hmm. that would be facing the mom. Mm -hmm. And the mom just had her shirt hiked up to her shoulders and her boobs hanging out and is pushing the cart while the kid is breastfeeding. Like, what? Who does that? Like who is? And then this poor child doesn't have a chance in the world. Oh my god! <laughs> like if that's the kind of parenting this kid's getting at eighteen months, when he's eighteen, he's gonna be a mess. I just feel bad. I'm like, someone needs to rescue that kid. Like, oh, like who does it? And she said both boobs were just hanging right out, and the one boob was in the kid's mouth. <laughs> In case he wanted to switch it up. Maybe one was chocolate and one was well, it's too regular. hard. It's like easier not to wear the bra so you can just lift your shirt up whenever your kid needs a little nutrition. Oh, my God. Which I actually I should use air quotes with nutrition because I have to wonder what else that woman has in her system. He's getting a little weed in that. Uh, I'm like, oh, my yeah. God. It's like, so it's easier without the bra to lift your shirt up all the way and just stick your boob in your kid's mouth while you're pushing the cart oh at Walmart. God. Can you imagine like th- that? This would be a great moment because I know like there. If you have you heard Walmart radio now in the store when you walk through, they it's always cranked up and they're all like way overly hyped. Oh jockeys. yeah, it's like hey everybody, it's Walmart radio. Hey, did you see the woman over by cosmetics? <laughs> oh, both boobs are out. <laughs> Oh She's my breastfeeding God. her kid. When's the last time you saw both boobs out in the Walmart? <laughs> hey, hey, sub sandwiches are on sale today in the deli. Make sure you go and check that out. A big shout out to store 424 for the cleanest restroom award of the year. You all get $5 off your next burger at Burger King. Here's Tina. <laughs> That's Walmart radio. Oh, that's about it. That is Walmart fucking radio. But I mean, you know, if you're such a multitasker, you know, the woman wants to shop with two hands and still breastfeed her kid. I guess that works. <laughs> I guess it's it is the ultimate multitasking, you know, right there. So here, put the boob in your mouth. <laughs> I don't care who's looking. Don't matter to me. 
Now, I have no problem with it going on in a responsible, uh, you know, discreet manner. That's cool, you know, but this whole like, yeah, that's the ultimate like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, and I have no problem, zero problem with women breastfeeding in public. And even yeah, like if actually I have seen a woman actually not covered up feeding her child. I'm like, I don't give no shit. And I'm okay. I'm okay in, you know, exactly. I'm totally okay with that. You know, it's just a little like that's fucked up. You're pushing the car. This just and, screams of child abuse, like yeah. or neglect or like or drug addiction. Yeah. Or like the kid doesn't have a chance. Yeah. You know, it's like if this is her idea of good parenting, like, oh, you know, well, like is that kid really going to know his name by the time he goes to kindergarten and how to spell <laughs> it? Or will he know how to read by the time he's in the second grade? Like. I just I. I mean, not like a kid would know how to read by the time. But, you know, mm-hmm. most kids, by the time they get to kindergarten, I know. know their colors. They know their alphabet. I mean, my oldest nephew couldn't <clears throat> even talk yet, but could arrange the alphabet with the letters, the magnetic letters on the refrigerator mm-hmm. in order. A, B, C, D, all the way. Couldn't even talk yet. And could do that. Like. Now that said, he's a national merit scholar and a Shakespearean and was scholar. also double breastfed at a Safeway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? This is the key to intelligence. It's just, I don't know. I, I it gives me. It just seems I, like I, the I've been having laziness. a hard time with hope for the future lately. <laughs> no I just see a lot of signs that are like, <laughs> oh shit. Oh yeah, you know, Idiocracy, the movie, it kicked in a hell of a lot faster than I thought it would. I thought like maybe I'll be really old when. No, we're fucking almost there. I mean, yeah. there's so many parts of that movie that have pretty much come true. Ah, uh, yeah, good times, good times. Anyway, that's my story. Yeah. Well, actually, it's not mine. It's my sister's story, but. That's great. I, th- I just felt the need to share that. It is a horror story. It is a horror story. <laughs> it's a horror so, story. It's not paranormal. It's not paranormal. That's scary as shit. No one people are like that. Are it normal. is a horror story. <laughs> God. <laughs> Turns out like the child's Damien. It's like, oh my God, it's the Antichrist. Why? What happened? Oh, yep. There you go. All right. Let's go to our first uh <laughs> Uh, story of the day. It says, this is Colleen from Northern Minnesota. This story took place over several months and involved three of us. I have an older friend, Margaret. She's more like a mother than a friend. She's amazing. First woman in the area to get her pilot's license, had her plane for years, bought part of the island before she ever met her husband. She wanted a cabin. She's 84 and still runs her own boat up to her cabin on that island. She's very mechanically inclined and knows more about cars and boat motors than a lot of men, and she has a big, big heart. She and her husband were married for 53 years, very happily, and raised three boys. My point is, she has a sharp, analytical mind. When the boys were young, Margaret and Frank built a house, not in the sense of hiring contractors, but built the house themselves with their own hands. They did a particularly excellent job, and all these years later, the house is still solid and perfect. It is a good house. They loved it. About nine years ago, though, Frank found out he had cancer, and by the time they found it, he had it throughout his body, and there was nothing that could be done. She brought him home from the hospital, and he died a month after learning he was sick. It was rough, but Margaret is tough, and she adjusted. She had his urn in her bedroom on the floor next to the bed, and I really never noticed it, even though I would go into the room from time to time when she wasn't home. Margaret does a lot of traveling to see her boys, And a few years ago, she moved 300 miles south to help raise a grandchild, but she kept her house. I was over there every day then, taking care of the mail, looking for random items, or doing whatever she needed. And this is where the first thing happened. Margaret was at her son's house 300 miles away and was packing to fly out to Colorado to visit another son. She has one ring she wanted to wear on that trip, and although she was sure she packed it, she couldn't find it. So she asked me to go look in her jewelry boxes and send it to her. Margaret has five jewelry boxes and a long, low dresser on the west wall of the bedroom. About six feet to the right is a north wall and a big window. There's an oil painting on the floor under the window. And then several feet to the right of that is a tall dresser. On that dresser are two antique glass oil lamps and five extra chimneys. Those glass chimneys are fragile and getting hard to find, so she bought as many as she could one day. 
So I was in her room on the phone with her as I looked for the ring she wanted. I wasn't finding it. She was asking me to look in her dresser drawers, just on the off chance it had slid inside, when I heard a strange noise behind me and to the right. One of the chimneys had flown from the dresser top over to the window where it fell and hit the frame on the painting before it hit the carpet. First of all, the windows and doors were all closed. There was no draft in the room, and the chimney should have broken when it hit the picture frame. There was not a mark on it. I went, oh my God. I told Margaret what had happened. She said, put me on speakerphone. I did, and she yelled, Frank, she's supposed to be looking through my things. Leave her alone. She said she's heard noises in the house, but had never had anything that clear happen. But he was a friend, so I was not worried. I finished her chores and left. Margaret came home again to stay, and I didn't think anything more about flying oil lamps until one night extremely late, she called me. She was overly excited and said, remember the oil lamp? It just happened to me too. So this happened to two different people several months apart. Now, a few months ago, Margaret found out she's sick too and is going to die. She sold the house to move 300 miles south close to Mayo Clinic where she needs to be. She hired a great moving company and had me come make sure she did not forget anything she needed to. Two moving trucks showed up on a Thursday and they started packing the house up. At one point, Margaret had told me she was going to have the urn in her car with her on the way to her new home, but she forgot to tell the movers and I did not remember either until they were working in her room. I said, excuse me, but did you see a wooden box on the floor by her bed? Oh, yes, ma'am. We've, uh, we have uh, that all packed and ready to go. You should have seen the looks on their faces when I told them, can you please unpack that box again? Because it's actually Margaret's husband and she wanted him to be in the car with her. It was so funny. They assured us it was the first time they had ever packed a husband. They hand packed or they handed me the box all wrapped in a moving blanket and shrink wrapped as I put it in the passenger seat of the car for her. No worries. Until the next day. Friday, Margaret left right away in the morning, and it was my job to stay at the house until everything was out and then do a walkthrough with the movers. So I spent the entire day there with them, reading books on my phone and talking and answering questions. And I was really impressed. They wrapped every single piece of furniture in blankets, used big insulated-sized rolls of plastic wrap to shrink wrap every item, and those rolls of plastic are huge and heavy. The movers left one of the rolls of wrap standing on the end of the fireplace, hearth in the living room. They were all doing other things. I was walking back into the living room and got there just in time to see the huge roll of plastic lift into the air about two feet and fly halfway across the big living room. It did not tip or roll. It flew against all the laws of physics. I yelled, Frank, you're moving today whether you want to or not, so knock it off. This is the point where Margaret's cleaner came into the room and said, so he's acting up again. All proceeded to tell me that several times when she had been in the house, there had been huge bangs and other strange noises. Margaret had not had a cleaner when Frank was alive, and neither of us had told her of our strange flying oil lamps. Since Margaret's been gone, which has been about two months now, she's not had anything strange happen in her new apartment. But that urn is there. When Margaret's gone to the ashes will be mixed with hers, taken to their cabin on that island that they both loved. I wonder about flying oil lamps and shrink wrap rolls and whether there's anything strange going on in that house yet. There you go. I like that one. I did too. It gave me all the feels mm -hmm. in different ways. Like, I thought it was beautiful that they had such a great friendship and I love that. Put me on speakerphone. Stop that. Mm -hmm. Like, I just love that. But then, like, you know, she then she ends up terminal and they're going to end up together. It's kind of a beautiful love story. It was just a really good story. And I could see him if he's in that house and that's the house they loved and you're attached to a house. Like, you know, if you really love your house, there's a strong attachment there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with all those good memories they had, he probably didn't want to leave. Yeah. But then, you know, he wants to be with her and because he has to be with her because that's the love story part. Mm -hmm. I love that the ashes will be combined. That's very sweet. That was very sweet. That was a good one. And I'm not even going to play a corny song 
because I like that story. Oh, this is so sweet. <laughs> so many I could go to, but we'll hold up on that. Are you going to? No, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, yes, 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. And I got this one here. And this woman says that she sent you a message saying she's sending in the she story. She did. So. She did. She messaged me this past weekend and she listened to this story of me with Doug. Mm-hmm. Um, if you haven't listened to that one, I don't know where, where you find it, <laughs> but it's somewhere. It's back in, in the that, archive. Yeah. It's somewhere way back there, but it was about a guy I had dated and, and after he died, he visited me and um, it was very I don't know. It's just a very emotional story for me to share. Mm-hmm. But so she had a story kind of like that. Yep. And so I really want to hear this. Okay, here we go. Let's hear the story. Hey guys, it's June in Minnesota. If you don't play this on the podcast, please let Carol listen to it. I sent her a message after I listened to her Doug story. And I told her that I would share my Randy story. <clears throat> Um, when I was in high school, I had my first boyfriend at age 16. His name was Randy. And, um, you know, we started off, you know, dating, but also just like really good friends. And, um, I remember on our first date, he told me that he had a twin brother named Ryan that died when the family was in a car accident when Randy and Ryan were just three years old. Um, fast forward, um, a few months into our relationship, um, Randy, then got into a bad car accident, um, actually the day before his 17th birthday. And he never was really quite the same after that. And he definitely had, um, some kind of PTSD. Um, you know, it was a bad car accident, but he was okay. Other people were not so lucky. Um, but Randy was okay, but he definitely changed after that. And that certainly affected our relationship. Um, so a couple months after the car accident, um, he broke up with me and I was very sad. I was devastated. Um, I just, it was like someone had just ripped out my heart. I was so, so sad. Um, you know, eventually we both went off to college. I went to a four year school. He went to a trade school. And during my freshman year in college, I still had hope that maybe we'd reconnect at some point and we'd still talk here and there. But, um, you know, he was he changed after that car accident when he was 17. And, you know, that's that. And people change. And I certainly can't ever hold that against him. Um, So anyway, we definitely go our separate ways. Um, I hadn't seen him in many years, hadn't talked to him in a long time. And then um, when I was pregnant in the summer of 2007, I actually looked him up and I thought, oh, how neat would it be to just call him and see how he's doing and, you know, let him know that I'm thinking of him and I hope he's doing well. And then I thought, no, he's probably married with kids. I don't want to cause problems. I don't want you know, any drama. I just hope he's doing okay. And I'm thinking of him and I had my own stuff going on. I was in grad school, pregnant with my daughter. Um, and it had been at that point, probably six, seven years since we had even spoken. So it was kind of like, okay, if I call out of the blue, that's going to be weird. So I didn't, uh, that was August of 2007. I had my daughter in October of 2007 and, um, In December of 2007, I was on Facebook just scrolling through and a class, a friend of mine who was a classmate that I went to high school with had posted um, something like praying for a classmate's family. And I instantly, I read that and my heart just dropped and I thought, oh shit, something happened to Randy. Like I just knew something happened to Randy and I messaged, um, another person that we had gone to high school with who I was better friends with. And I said, what's going on? And she said, she wrote back right away. And she said, Randy committed suicide yesterday, 
well, yesterday was my birthday, December 6th. And um, it was, that was hard. That was a hard one. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, I had a really hard time with that. The Randy that I knew was happy and loved his family, would never want to hurt anyone. Um, he had a lot to live for. He had a great career. He was doing very well for himself. Uh, he had a wonderful, wonderful family. So I, I never, even to this day, I don't quite understand everything that led up to his death. Um, I do remember a few days after he died, I was alone in my apartment with my daughter, who was, you know, a few months old at this point. And... I was cleaning. I had my vacuum cleaner plugged into the wall and I was in the kitchen. The vacuum cleaner was in the living room and all of a sudden it turned on by itself. And I had never before or since had anything like that happen. So I thought that was possibly a sign for him that he was around checking on me and saying hi. Um, this was around the time that I started to have dreams about Randy. I would really consider them to be visitations. Um, some were him trying to explain to me why he did what he did. I do remember in a dream he said that it was time for him to be with his Jesus. Um, and that's what he would call it. He would call Jesus my Jesus, my God, a time for me to be with my Jesus. I remember other dreams where he was showing me what he was doing in heaven. One was like he really he was he was a farmer and so he worked on he worked on tractors and different machines and snowmobiles and in heaven, you know, in my dream anyway, he was showing me that he had all these engines to work on and um showing me that he was keeping busy and doing what he enjoyed doing. <clears throat> um by the spring of 2008, you know, after having all these visitation dreams and still trying to make sense of why this wonderful person would do this to themselves and to their family, um, I began growing increasingly frustrated. Um, I felt like the family didn't acknowledge that I was at one point in Randy's life someone that was important. You know, I had gone to his the wake. I didn't go to the funeral, but I did go to his wake. I saw his parents. I saw his brother, sister. And I just felt like I was just another person passing through. And to be fair, they're in extreme grief, trying to make sense of everything, having just lost their son and brother. And I'm sure my feelings at that time were very selfish. But I just did not feel acknowledged that I was in any way, shape, or form an important person in Randy's life. Um, so that just, I don't know, that always kind of felt unsettling for me and <clears throat> was hard. Um, around that same time in the spring of 2007, I had um, a dream, and it was kind of like a split screen, and I can still remember it very vividly. Um the left side of the screen was like life and chaos and stress and fear and all these human human emotions that we feel. And the right side of the screen was peace and calm and love and serenity. And in my dream, I kept, you know, it was a split screen right down the middle and I kept moving towards the right, towards the peace and calm side. And there was a voice that said, you need to wake up. I said, no, Randy's here. I'm not going to wake up. And the voice again said, you need to wake up. And I said, no. And Randy turned around and he looked at me. And he had the bluest eyes I had ever seen, even to this day. They were the most magnificent, beautiful blue eyes you could imagine. <clears throat> and I woke up. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird. But cool. You know, he was there. I could feel him. A lot of these visitation dreams, I would wake up and feel like I had just spent time with this person. And I had to remind myself that he was dead. 
And so in a way, for a split second, you feel this relief and all oh, this person's OK. And then you feel, oh, shit, he died. Um, the very day after I had that dream with the beautiful blue eyes, I received a letter from Randy's mom. And in the letter, she tells me that she has been working several months to write me a letter and just had a hard time writing me this letter. And the letter acknowledged that I was an important person in Randy's life, even though it was a long time ago. And in the letter, she told me that he was an organ donor. And because of his donation, two people got their sight back. And that's the moment that I knew that night, that dream I had just the night before with the beautiful blue eyes was Randy telling me he's okay. Telling me that just because his physical body was, I guess for lack of a better word, dissected to donate all these different parts for other people, he was, he was okay. And that's, that's when I knew that these were more than just dreams. These were something I really just can't explain. Um, so that was when his mother and I really started kind of having a friendship. We, we started to build a friendship. Um, I remember new year around new years of 2000, um, God, 2008, I um, was driving and I was at a, at a stoplight and there was a building, you know, commercial building next to the stoplight and there were signs for the different businesses inside of it. And one of the signs was Maureen Allen, Psychic Medium Intuitive Guide. And, you know, I turned the corner when the light turned green and went about my day, didn't think much of it. Well, for whatever reason, Maureen Allen, Psychic Medium Intuitive Guide, was stuck in my head. Not just for a couple days, for literally weeks. I had never seen a medium up until that point. I never looked into mediumship. I never had explored that side of spirituality or religion, whatever you want to call it. But this woman's name was stuck in my brain. So finally, I decided, okay, I'll give it a shot. Why not? There's, you know, there's a reason why I keep thinking about it. So I call and I make an appointment to see this medium. Um, our session, right in my hometown, not an inconvenience at all. And... Um, I go for my very first session. I really had no idea what to expect. Um, I was, it was very comforting. Maureen's wonderful. I highly recommend her. She's actually out in Laguna Beach, California now. She's no longer in Minnesota, um, but she's fantastic. I've seen her many times since, but this was my first time seeing her. And I was very comfortable. Um, it was, you know, not scary, not intimidating. Anyway, um, she said your boyfriend's here and she knew exactly how he died, that he had hung himself. Um, she knew all these details about our relationship. Um, I asked why did he commit suicide on my birthday of all days? And the only answer he could give was that it was a bad choice, which obviously it was. Um, so it was a pretty, um, breathtaking experience. This, you know, first meeting with Maureen and Randy coming through our session. Um, so I had eventually, I was a little hesitant to tell Randy's mom about it, but I did. Um, I thought, you know, if my sharing my story could help her find some kind of peace with having lost her son to suicide, then it's worth my embarrassment or however I might feel about sharing my story. Um, so I told his mom about having seen the psychic or psychic medium. Um, and 
you know, very hesitant, but I told her about it. And she said, I'd like to contact information. I'd like to maybe go check it out for myself. So, um, she went for herself and, you know, she kept a lot of it private. We didn't, she didn't share too much with me other than she knew that, you know, well, I I won't get into it. I want to, that's her, that's her story to tell. So anyway, um, Randy did come through for her is all I can really say about that. Um, and you know, over the months and years, Jan and I, uh, Randy's mom and I would get together for coffee and we'd write letters and send Christmas cards back and forth. Um, she got to meet my daughter a few times and we'd sometimes meet for dinner. And so I feel like it was a really beautiful relationship that we had developed. Um, she would always answer my questions about Randy and why he did what he did. Um, events in his life leading up to him wanting to take his own life to really help me understand where he was coming from and how he was feeling in his mindset. And I'm sure those were not easy conversations for her to have, but I'm forever grateful that she did because it really helped me understand a little bit better of what he was going through. Um, so one day, um, a couple years after Randy died, I had an appointment set up to see Maureen again. Um, but I forget exactly what happened. I had to reschedule. I had to call and change my appointment. Um, something came up and whatever. So I had it rescheduled. I think it was for the following week. And I went in for my, um, for my session and, you know, great session, really helpful. Um, Randy always came through. Um, so I, I do know that he's watching over me and, and watching out for me. Um, when I was leaving my session to go home, I left Maureen's office, went out into the hall and coming in is Randy's mom. And I will never forget the look on her face. She looked like she had just like seen a ghost, like, oh my God, what are you doing here? I never told you I was coming here at this day, at this time. She didn't know I was coming at that day, at that time either. And we had seen each other in the hall and I could not stop laughing because I knew that was Randy playing a joke on us. It was Randy saying, hey, I'm here. I'm watching over you and I'm. And I think what he's saying is he's glad that we have this friendship. So that was kind of crazy. (laughs) Um, After Jan had her session, she and I talked about what had happened. And she's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that happened. I had to reschedule. There's no way that that Maureen could have known that we knew each other. There's no way that um, anyone on her team could have put us back to back like this, knowing that we know each other. You know, I had to reschedule my appointment. And I said, well, I had to reschedule my appointment. So anyway, I thought that was just a funny little story. Um, over the years, um, I've, you know, gotten so many, um, have, or have had so many dreams with Randy that I eventually had to ask him to stop. It was getting a little overwhelming. I was dating my now husband and, you know, how do you have a relationship with someone that's dead? I mean, you just can't. And, um, I asked Randy to just, you know, please always look over us. Please always protect my daughter, but I need these dreams to stop. I'm, I've moved on with my life. I have this great man in my life who I love and I just need the dreams to stop. And they did, um, every once in a while, I'll still have a dream about Randy, but it's not a visitation dream. It's just a dream where he's there or you know I think it's definitely more based on memories um and anyone who's had a visitation dream knows the difference between the visitation dream and a regular um just a regular dream so anyway I really wanted to share that um I I, I really do love Carol's story about Doug and the painting. And I just think it's such a beautiful, beautiful story. And I certainly don't think mine is 
the same caliber, but I really wanted to share it. Thank you for listening. Please make sure Carol hears this, even if you don't put it on the podcast. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen. And um, if anyone is thinking dark thoughts or contemplating suicide, um, Suicide Awareness Voices of Education in Bloomington, Minnesota is a great resource. I've done a lot of fundraising for them since Randy's death. I would not let his death happen in vain. And I've... um, help raise money for this organization. They're called SAVE. The website is SAVE, S-A-V-E dot org. Um, They have a lot of great resources. They're they're a leader in the nation for helping those um, contemplating suicide, helping those who are survivors of suicide, helping those that are grieving because they lost someone to suicide. Um, Mental illness in this country is, is a definite issue, and Randy is just one of many that fell through the cracks. And, um, I don't know, with any luck, maybe this story can help somebody make a better life for themselves. Anyway, thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Bye, guys. Thank you for sharing that story. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. That really, really got me in the heart. Yeah. That, no, I, but, like, I really appreciate her taking the time to... um give some resources after sharing that story. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's really important, but yeah, she messaged me and she's like, so I really, really did want to hear that story. And, and she's right. Like the visitation dreams are totally different than a regular dream. Sure. And, you know, and anyone who's had one gets it. It's like you wake up and it's like, you just had this time with them. And it's so weird And like when she was, when she said that she had to ask him to not come back to her anymore, because how can you have a relationship with someone that's dead? I remember uh, the guy who I dated after Doug and he recently died of COVID this past year. Mm -hmm. I remember him saying that to me. How do you, he goes, how do I compete with some guy who's dead? I remember that. So when she said that, I was like, whoa, that's like real life shit. But I don't know. It's just it really um, it really touched my heart because especially with a suicide, yeah, you have so many questions. And like with Doug, it was a car accident, and so I like there's so many things you want to say, and they're just suddenly gone. Like sure. you had a date, you stood me up. Like what? What is you? Know, you can't be dead. Yeah, you know and. So I think when you have those kind of visitation dreams, they kind of, and like with Doug kind of coming to me um, after he died, it gave me that peace and that, and some closure that I desperately needed. And, you know, it takes grief is long and dark and ugly and all the things, all the emotions. Yeah. But, um, but it just takes a lot of time. But the one thing you need are some answers. You need a little closure and that was one thing I I did feel like I got. I remember he came to me in a dream one night. And it was one of those visitation dreams. And I remember he said to me, I won't be back. This is, and I'm like, what do you mean? You can't leave. Mm-hmm. And he's like, this is it. I have to go. <clears throat> and I never had another one of those again, ever. And so I think, you know, I, I wish they happened to everyone when you lost someone, especially when you need those answers. Sure. And I don't know, you know, I don't get it. Like I had one of my really dear friends died and I kept thinking I would have one Mm -hmm. and I didn't. But then I'm like, you know what? I didn't have anything left undone with him. And we had the last thing we said was how much we loved each other and how much we cared. So I don't know. I think those are just a gift. And but I also get why you have to stay. Ask, like in her case, like we have to stop this because it is like having a relationship yeah. with someone who's dead. It isn't. Uh, uh, that's where I started thinking of the song "Iris" from the Goo Goo Dolls and "City of Angels." Wasn't that kind of that sort of a premise, or wasn't I don't somebody remember. dead? Nicholas Cage still had a career it's before that. Died. I don't know, but I thought there was something <laughs> of the that. Um, that well, I don't remember. I, it's been so long since I've seen that, but it was a very. I'm really glad that you played that one because I was really curious because she said she was going to call in and I really wanted to hear it. Yeah, yeah. And and the fact that she was able to develop that relationship with 
his mom. Mm -hmm. Like I had a relationship with Doug's brother for a long time, but it was really hard because Doug and Randy had the exact same voice. Oh, wow. So if I talked to him on the phone, it was like I was talking to Doug and I was having a hard time <sighs> yeah. being friends with Randy because sure. I just wanted to hear his voice all the time. Yeah. And so eventually, you know, I haven't seen him in years. I don't know. I hope he's doing well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I kind of had to move on. Sure. You know. Oh, that, was, that one just got me all mm -hmm. emotional. Thank you for sharing that one with us. We do appreciate you taking the time to put that together and uh, send it in. That's going to wrap up today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. If you like the show, keep us on the air. Become an extra podcast person. Sign up at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. $5 a month gets you access to all the bonus material. We greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, for all of us at Real Ghost Stories Online, Tony Bruschi, thanks for listening.